people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I am your host Shivangi Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Recently, the 54th World Economic Forum was held in Davos, Switzerland. Global leaders, industry experts and visionaries gathered to discuss some of the most pressing challenges facing the world. The theme of this year's summit was Rebuilding Trust. Take a look. Global investors, business leaders and government representatives from across the world descended in Davos, Switzerland to attend the 54th World Economic Forum held this week. The summit addressed many challenges faced across the globe including issues where India has been active on the global stage like trade, climate change and economic growth. The annual meeting of the World Economic Forum provided space to focus on the fundamental principles driving trust including transparency, consistency and accountability. During a panel discussion, the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken mentioned that the India-US conversation always underscores the significance of democracy and human rights and the relationship between the two countries has reached a new height. He also praised Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's leadership. We see an extraordinary success story and we see the remarkable achievements uh, that um, uh, Prime Minister Modi has um, achieved, moved forward uh, under his watch that have materially benefited and materially positively affected uh, so many Indian lives. We also see uh, a relationship between our countries that is in a new place, at a new level. And that's been, I think, the very deliberate um, effort of both uh, the Prime Minister and, uh, and President Biden, who believes in this deeply. At the same time, a constant, regular part of our conversation uh, is the conversation about democracy, about rights. In the latest Global Competitiveness Report, India has slipped to the 40th position. The report reveals that India's score has improved across most pillars of competitiveness. India's economic activity has sustained its strong momentum with both urban and rural demand supporting growth. The strong thrust by the government on capital expenditure, coupled with signs of a pickup in private investment and healthy aggregate demand conditions that are expected to lift a real GDP growth. According to the National Statistics Office's initial advance estimates, India's economy is expected to grow by 7.3% in the current fiscal year 2023-2024. This makes it the major economy with the fastest rate of growth. The Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Shaktikan Das, noted during the summit that there is an all-time high confidence in India world over. I said that uh, current year, that is for the current financial year, RBI's growth projection was 7%. The NSO, National Statistics Office has said 7.3%. So in fact, when we said 7% for current year, there are a lot of opinion, a lot of views outside that RBI was over-projecting. But the actu in actuality, the National Statistics Office, which has a lot more data, has said 7.3% for current year. And for next year, that is the financial year 24-25, what I mentioned is that my sense is that India's GDP growth will touch 7%. Meanwhile, India has pledged to achieve 500 gigawatts of non-fossil electricity capacity 
generate half of all energy requirements from renewables and reduce emissions by 1 billion tons by 2030 as part of an ambitious five-part Panch Amrit pledge at COP26 in 2021. The country also aims to reduce the intensity of emissions in its GDP by 45%. Finally, India commits to net zero emissions by 2070. On the sidelines of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Union Minister Hardeep Singh Puri said that he is optimistic about the green hydrogen. When you saw the session, how, uh, how much energy there is and how much interest there is in green hydrogen. And green hydrogen is the fuel of the future. And I think the world over, the focus is on green hydrogen as the fuel of the future. And I think what is also coming out that India has some inherent advantages because you have a large consuming population there'll be a large demand for uh, energy and as we transition to greener energy i think green hydrogen will arrive on our scene uh, sooner than later the world economic forum is an international non-governmental organization for public private sector collaboration based in switzerland the 54th annual meeting welcomed over 100 governments, all major international organizations, 1,000 forum partners, as well as civil society leaders, experts, youth representatives and social entrepreneurs. Days after Iran launched air strikes on terror bases in Pakistan, Islamabad retaliated with strikes inside Iran targeting separatist Balochi militants. Pakistan says Iran has violated its airspace, which resulted in killing of two children and also injured few. A report. Pakistan's foreign ministry in a statement said that two children were killed as Iran launched air attacks destroying two bases of Balochi terror group Jaish al Adl, which Islamabad described as a violation of its airspace. Iran's attacks on Pakistan comes weeks after more than 84 people died in a twin blast in southern Iran. The incident happened when Pakistan's caretaker Prime Minister met Iran's Foreign Minister on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum in Davos. In response to Iran airstrikes, Pakistan retaliated by conducting strikes inside Iran, which killed four people targeting separatist Baloch militants amid rising tensions between the neighbouring nations. Pakistan said it used killer drones and rockets to strike separatist Baloch militants inside Iran. Iran has condemned the action and has demanded an explanation. Kishwar Hamsaye, Dost and Brother of Pakistan, are the goal of the attacks and the attacks ایران نبودند گروهی موسوم به جیش العدل که یک گروه تروریستی ایرانی است و در بخش‌های از مناطق پاکستان در استان سیستان و بلوچستان پاکستان پناه گرفته‌اند و ما بارها در مورد اون با مقامات عالی رتبه نظامی، امنیتی و سیاسی پاکستان گفتگو کردیم Meanwhile, Pakistan's foreign ministry spokesperson recalled its ambassador from Iran and the Iranian ambassador to Pakistan who is currently visiting Iran will not be allowed to come back. The spokesperson said Pakistan reserves the right to respond to this illegal act and the responsibility for the consequences will lie squarely with Iran. Pakistan reserves the right to respond to this illegal act and the responsibility for the consequences will lie squarely with Iran. We have conveyed this message to the government of Iran. We have also informed them that Pakistan has decided to recall its ambassador from Iran and that the Iranian ambassador to Pakistan who is currently visiting Iran may not return for the time being. We have also decided to suspend all high-level visits which were ongoing 
or were planned between Pakistan and Iran in the coming days. Residents of Islamabad have expressed solidarity with the country as they say they are largely supportive of Pakistan's recent airstrikes on militant targets inside Iran. Iran should not do this way with Pakistan. This is a Muslim country. It is also a Muslim country. If the Muslim country will take one another's tongue, this is not a good thing. If they have done it, then if our army has done it, I am with my army and my whole country has done it. It is a wonderful army and the army has done it. We are standing with our army and we are happy with this. We are not afraid of any other country. The Pakistani government has said that they are not afraid of any other country. The neighbors have had rocky ties in the past, but the strikes are the highest profile cross-border intrusions in recent years and come amid growing worries about instability in the Middle East since the war between Israel and Hamas started on October 7 last year. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Brunei celebrated the wedding of Prince Abdul Mateen, son of world's longest reigning monarch Sultan Hassan al Bolkia, in a lavish 10-day-long royal wedding ceremony in the oil-rich Sultanate. The prince and his bride Anisha Rosna Isa Kalebik, the granddaughter of one of his father's key advisors, attended one of the many royal ceremonies before taking part in a parade through the streets of Brunei's capital, Bandar Seri Bigawan. The couple's Islamic solemnization ceremony took place last week. Leaders from neighboring countries were seen in attendance on Sunday's royal wedding ceremony. Prince Martin has gained his fame in recent years, accompanying his father on diplomatic engagements, including the coronation of King Charles and the funeral of Queen Elizabeth in 2022. North Korea this week celebrated the state's first sports day of 2024 with various sporting events in snowy weather. Young students were seen demonstrating taekwondo and playing various sports games. KCNA footage also showed workers from Pyongyang Dental Hygiene Products Factory playing volleyball. North Korea has marked every second Sunday of every month as National Sports Day since 1992, according to South Korea's Unification Ministry. Indonesia's Marapi volcano erupted spewing ash some 1.3 km into the sky just a month after a previous eruption killed at least 20 people according to the country's geological agency. Nearby homes, vegetation, vehicles and tents were seen coated in a thick layer of ash from the volcano which erupted at least twice. It warned of possible lava flowing through the rivers or around valleys within a 4.5 km radius around the crater and has asked residents in the danger zone to evacuate. Following the eruption, a local clinic was seen crowded with mask-clad patients waiting to get their health checked. Staff from the regional disaster agency were also seen handling out masks to people on the streets. Indonesia straddles the so-called Pacific Ring of Fire, an area of high seismic activity that rests atop multiple tectonic plates. Moving on. In the capital city of Pakistan, a large number of Baloch families are participating in the sit-in protest for the safe recovery of missing persons. The majority of participants are elderly people, women and children, all of whom are relatives of victims of enforced disappearances. Dr. Maharang Baloch, who is leading the protest against extrajudicial killings, is saying that people are facing both physical and mental torment by Pakistani security forces. However, the ongoing Baloch protests are posing a significant challenge to those who are sitting in power. Airport. For more than a month, the Baloch women's protest has persisted, spanning from Turbat, Balochistan to Islamabad. 
Despite facing freezing temperatures, women, children and men are steadfastly leading the protest with over 200 families joining the cause. The protests ignited following the disappearance of Baloch youngster Balach Molabaksh on October 29. Despite being presented in court by the Counter-Terrorism Department of Balochistan on November 21, Baksh was reportedly killed in a disputed encounter just two days later, sparking widespread outrage. Led by the Baloch Yagjahiti Committee, the main protests journeyed from Turbat to Quetta and then to Islamabad, where the Baloch march is now in its third week, unfortunately ignored by the government, judiciary and other stakeholders. Despite its peaceful nature, the state's response has been marked by arrests, lodging fake cases and attempts to undermine the movement through misinformation, drawing accusations from Baloch marchers who claim the police are complicit in harassing peaceful protesters. بلوچ نسل کشی کے خلاف جاری آج اس تحریک کے پچاس وے دن ہم بلوچستان سمیت پوری دنیا میں ہمارے اس تحریک کے تعاون کرنے والے اور سپورٹ کرنے والے لوگوں سے مخاطب ہے آج ہماری تحریک کو ریاستی جبر اور ریاستی تشدد کے بعد سب سے بڑے کریک ڈاؤن کا سامنا ہے ریاست کی جانب سے بٹھائے گئے نون اسٹیٹ ایکٹرز کی جانب سے اس تحریک کو سبوتاش کرنے کے لیے اب وائلنس کی طرف یہ لوگ لے جانا چاہتے ہیں کیونکہ اس تحریک میں جتنے بھی افراد شامل ہیں وہ تمام بلوچستان کے مختلف حصوں سے بلوچ لاپتہ افراد کے لوائکین ہیں جن میں عورتیں بچے اور بوڑے اور بزرگ شامل ہیں جب اسٹیٹ نے اپنی تمام ترقوت لگائی ہے کہ کیسے اس تحریک کو سبوتاش کیا جائے آج ہمارے درنے میں موجود جتنے بھی فیملیز ہیں ان سب کو عراسہ کیا جا رہا ہے Solidarity protests are now happening in Karachi, Punjab and Balochistan in support of the main sit-in by the Baloch Yagjahiti Committee in Islamabad against enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings. For decades, Balochistan has endured human rights abuses and extrajudicial killings as highlighted in the 2023 Human Rights Commission of Pakistan report, which emphasized the impunity with which disappearances, especially of political activists, occurred. Baloch activists have recently filed a petition urging the UN to investigate human rights violations in Balochistan, demanding a fact-finding mission led by the United Nations Working Group. Baloch Yagjati Committee has been published by the online petition in which the UN Summit تمام انسانی حقوق کے اداروں سے اپیل کی جاتی ہے کہ وہ بلوچستان میں آئیں اور یو این کی فیکٹ فائنڈنگ مشن کے تحت بلوچستان میں ہونے والے جبری گمشدگیوں، مسخ شدہ لاشوں، ٹارگٹ کلنگز اور اجتماعی قبروں کے کیسز کو ریپورٹ کیا جائے اور دنیا بر کے سامنے لائے جائے اور جو ادارے بلوچ نسل کشی میں ملوث ہیں ان کا احتساب کیا جائے یہ پیٹیشن دنیا کے کسی بھی کونے میں اوپن ہو سکتی ہے اس میں ریکوائیڈ انفارمیشن ڈال کے اس کو سائن کر کے اپنی یکجہتی کا ثبوت دیں اور اس بات کا ثبوت دیں کہ اس وقت بلوچستان میں جو تحریک جاری ہے آپ اس کی حمایت کرتے ہیں اور بلوچستان میں ہونے والی ظلم جبر اور نائن صافیوں کے خلاف آپ ہمارے ساتھ اس تحریک میں کھڑے ہیں The Pakistan Army's systematic atrocities on intellectuals, journalists, students and political activists have intensified human rights violations, silencing those who seek their rights and justice. The Baloch, suffering socially and financially, express dissatisfaction with the Pakistani government's response, turning to the international community for intervention and resolution. This historic women-led march, the largest in Balochistan's history, underscores the urgent need for the government to address the legitimate demands of the Baloch marchers before the situation escalates further. Moving on to Nepal's Taruka village, where locals came together to celebrate their cultural heritage through the age-old tradition of annual bullfighting or Guru Judai. 
This annual festival brings a sense of community spirit and showcases the rich tapestry of Nepalese traditions. During the festival, spectators gather to witness the skilled handlers and the powerful bulls engage in a display of strength and agility. The annual bullfighting festival in Nepal's Taruka village is a long-standing tradition that takes place on the first day of Magh, the 10th month of the lunar calendar. The festival is also known as Guru Judai or bullfighting and dates back to the 19th century. The festival accompanied by music and dance and is a way for villagers to greet and entertain the king. Turn by turn, the humpy bulls enter an arena controlled by experienced cattle rearers and fight for as long as 45 minutes to prove their strength. Surrounded by hundreds of revelers who shout and cheer in support, some of the bulls run off from the arena, while those standing till the end of the allocated time of 45 minutes are declared winners upon proving their strength. Nepal's Taruka in Nuwako district, about 90 kilometers from the capital Kathmandu, has been organizing the annual bullfighting or Guru Judai festival with fanfare. This festival, first introduced by the then Prince of Bajang, J. Prithvi Bahadur Singh, for entertainment purposes during his visit to his maternal uncle's house. Since then, the locals of Taruka village have continued the tradition over the years. लाई त खानदिनी भने अब नरिवल खानदिन्छ चामल मास हैन गोरला खानदिन त त्यही हो है अनि घास खानले घास खानदिनु पर्यो कि त्यसले मते अगाउँदैन अर्थ त के खानदिन र जुदानी भइसेवासी चार पाँच महिना अगाडि बाला त्यसलाई अलि दाना पानी चाहिँ भनु न चामल है अ मासहरु है अ त्यस्तो अब पोटी कुराहरु चाहिँ त्यतिखेर देखि सुरु गर्छ चार पाँच महिना अगाडि देखि during the festival, a total of 17 bulls competed to secure the top position in the competition, thus proving their strength as well as the cash prize. Bull owners feed their bull with various cereals, rice flour, oils and vitamins to increase stamina and tame their pet, making it eligible for fighting. <laughs> A large number of people from Nuwakot itself as well as adjoining districts and other parts of Nepal throng the mountainous field of Nuwakot on this day to see this annual event. Since the 19th century, this annual event has not only preserved traditional culture in the Himalayan nation with its vivid cultural diversity, but it has also contributed to the tourism development of the area. The bullfighting festival not only entertains but also provides an opportunity for locals to come together, reinforcing the bonds that tie them to their roots. And Taruka village echoed with sounds of celebration. And with that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.